Now, uh, our last talk will be presented in this section. It will be presented by Guy Rosen from Weissman Institute of Science about the temporarily and specially resolved measurements of the structure and the magnetic field distribution of an imploding plasma. Hello. Um, I know we are running late, so I'll, talking, I'll try to be brief, but let me assure you I'm going to fail. So, uh, as uh, Professor Karsik said, the title of my talk is uh, Temporally and Specially Resolved Measurement of the Structure and uh, Magnetic Field Distribution in an Imploding Plasma. And um, the in, by imploding plasma, we mean, uh, in this case, a gas plus leapage, which starts when the gas is injected into a vacuum chamber. Um, subsequently, it is ionized by a current which rises to 500 kiloamps. Uh, for, uh, during uh, 500 nanoseconds, and the, um, the gas puff is made of uh, on-axis jet surrounded by a cylindrical shell. The, um, the dimensions of the shell, the initial dimensions, are uh, 9 millimeters in height and 38 millimeters in diameter, and the gas is um, re-ionized by high-energy electrons, um, and then as the current flows, it um, further ionizes the gas and also induces a magnetic field, which in turn uh, gives rise to the J cross B Lorentz force, which is implodes the plasma until stagnation is reached on axis. Uh, and during the stagnation phase, the hot and dense core is uh, formed for about 10 nanoseconds, and temperature rises to uh, 200 electron volts, and the uh, density reaches 10 to the 20 uh, electrons per centimeter cube. And the peak X-ray emission um, during stagnation is what we denote as T equals zero throughout uh, our research. So the motivation for studying the magnetic field um, um, distribution stems from the fact that the magnetic field is the driving force of the implosion, and therefore it, it's a key player in all the properties of the plasma and the processes uh, throughout the stagnation. About the, sorry, about the implosion. And the study of the magnetic field of the measurements can uh, serve to indicate first where the current is flowing, understand various mechanisms such as uh, pressure balance, uh, energy transfer, um, matter le being left behind the inward going piston, uh, calculate uh, the plasma conductivity from diffusion of the magnetic field into the plasma, and study um, instabilities. Uh, instability development. Now, although the magnetic field is what determines most of these processes and the properties of the plasma, it is also influenced by these proce uh, processes, and especially by the structure of the plasma, which is caused by the instabilities. And therefore, studying the magnetic field is highly uh, rewarding, but is also very, very challenging. Now, the study of magnetic field relies on the Zeeman effect, where um, uh, the, both the high and low energy levels of any transitions are split due to the magnetic field. Light emitted from transitions between these split le levels is polarized, and the polarization depends on the difference in the quantum number m, which is the projection of the total angular momentum on the, uh, electric on the magnetic field. Um, so, um, uh, dipoles, uh, resulting uh, electric dipole of transitions in which delta m equals zero are oscillating along the magnetic field line, and they are called um, the pi component. And the um, dipoles from transitions in which delta m equals plus or minus one rotate about the magnetic field lines, and they are called sigma plus and sigma sigma minus. Now, when viewed, when the emission is viewed perpendicular to the magnetic field. Both these um, components emit light with uh, linear uh, polarization. And when viewed parallel to, to the magnetic field line, the pi component is not visible, and the sigma components um, are circularly polarized. Now, in the past, uh, in our lab, polarization spectroscopy was used to discriminate between the pi and the sigma component. When the, field was, when the emission was viewed uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field. 
And from the line shapes, the time-dependent magnetic field distribution uh, was determined. Now, although this extermination was, experimentation was pushed to the max and was done very thoroughly, the measurements were still limited to relatively large radii and early phases of the implosion. Furthermore, this uh, method is inapplicable for high energy density plasmas, and uh, it is sensitive to opacity since it relies on the uh, shapes and the weights of the, um, of the emission lines, which can be dominated by stark or Doppler uh, broadenings or by opacity. So currently what we're doing is we're using polarization spectroscopy to discriminate between the sigma plus and sigma minus uh, components, the circular polarization of which, uh, of the magnetic, of the Zeeman split emission, when viewing the uh, magnetic field, the, the emission parallel to the magnetic field. So it is important to mention that the sigma plus polarization is uh, blue shifted uh, and the sigma minus is red shifted. So um, when the emissions are passed through uh, our quarter wave plate, the circular polarization is transformed into orthogonal linear polarization. And then a, a linear um, polarizer permits only one polarization to pass, to pass. And combining that with the fact that one is always blue shifted and the other is red, shift, red shifted, um, the, de um, determining the magnetic field relies on line position rather than line shapes. And therefore, it is um, relatively, relatively insensitive to other broadening mechanisms such as Stark and Doppler and opacity. Of course, one requirement is that all broadening mechanism, mechanisms don't cause the lines of interest to overlap with other lines. Another requirement is that the emission is viewed parallel to the magnetic field. And since we need both polarizations to determine the magnetic field, you either need the reproducibility of your experiment or you need to um, simultaneously measure both uh, polarizations. In our diagnostic system, uh, the light from the uh, imploding plasma is imaged onto a fiber array, which then transmits the light into a 1.26 meter spectrometer, uh, coupled to an ICCD camera. Now, we have several um, fiber arrays, which we use for different uh, needs. And this setup also gives us uh, higher flexibility because the receiving end of the fiber can be easily uh, repositioned and rotated to accommodate different needs and different measurements. Um, polarization optics, namely the, lambda, the quarter wave plate and the um, linear polarizers, are placed here between the imaging lens and the uh, fiber, receiving end of the fibers. Now, um, in addition to this setup, we have another spectrometer, 30 centimeter spectrometer, uh, which of course has a, ver a lower resolution, but in turn gives us a broader uh, spectrum, and this uh, helps us to determine the, uh, in addition to the magnetic field, determine the um, uh, temperature and the density of the plasma. Um, now, as I mentioned, one requirement or, uh, of the, the system is that the uh, emission is viewed parallel to the magnetic field line. And this means that you would have to view uh, only the outer edge of the plasma column. And for that reason, the first uh, one, of, one research uh, made with this uh, method only gave uh, the magnetic field uh, strength at relatively large radii. It was something like 11 uh, millimeters. Now, uh, the improvement we have introduced to this uh, relies on the fact that there is a very steep uh, temperature gradient from the hot and dense core inside going outwards. And this means that highly charged ions uh, reside on the inner radii and uh, the lower charge, charge state reside, reside outside. So if you measure two different lines from different charge states, and the, the example here is of uh, oxygen-3 and oxygen-6 oxygen line, they reside in different um, uh, layers of the column. And to understand this picture, I want to show an illustration. Imagine you are viewing the plasma column from the top, and this is, let's say these are uh, different charge state uh, layers, uh, going from high charge states down to lower charge states. And if we're using a linear fiber array, so we have, in, in this case, we have 50 fibers, and they are 
placed horizontally with respect to the um, to the plasma column, what you get is no, yes, is you would get different viewing cords. All of these other fibers are viewing the same Z positions, but each, each of them is placed in a different, what we call the Y position. So we have one fiber going to, well, we have fibers going to, uh, radially, and then we have outer cords. And this is what you see here. Each line here is a different fiber. So this is the Y axis. And this is, of course, the spectrum, the, the uh, uh, wavelength axis. So now you can see here that the oxygen six line, line only reaches about between four and five millimeters. So this could be this layer here. And the oxygen three line reaches almost eight millimeters. This would be uh, this um, layer. And now if you measure emission from here, of both, both polarization, and then emission from here, this would give the local uh, magnetic field strength in this region because it is perpendicular, uh, parallel to the magnetic field in this region, and measurements from this line would give the magnetic field uh, at this location. So, um, using these two lines, we have obtained the um, magnetic, strip, um, magnetic field strength at two different uh, radii, and we have a third radius, which is the outer radius, uh, outer radius of the plasma, and if we divide the total current measured at that, the time of the measurement um, by the outermost radius, we have another point. And the outermost radius is measured from uh, two-dimensional imaging of the plasma being taken uh, concurrently with the spectroscopic uh, measure. So we have at least three points for each uh, time frame. These are, of course, different measurements, or different uh, simple uh, instances. And we fit, uh, uh, we still have uh, computations to do, but we fit a simple uh, exponential um, fit to these lines uh, in accordance with a simplified solution of a diffusion equation. So, to conclude, um, using the polarization spectroscopy, along with the charge set la layer uh, of the plasma column, we can obtain several um, positions or several measurements of the magnetic field at, uh, at a single uh, experiment. And these are, of course, time resolved using the ITCD. Um, in addition, the electron uh, temperature and density are measured. And the current, current uh, penetration into the plasma seems to follow um, the, the diffusion equation. Of course, a more rigorous uh, solution of the equation is needed, and the curvature of the field must be taken into account. Uh, and this will lead the, yield the connectivity of the plasma and will also serve to um, provide details of the plasma acceleration, ohmic heating, and various other processes I mentioned before. Now, even at this stage, it seems that little to no current flows through the stagnation uh, region. And this suggests that the magnetic field plays a relatively minor role in the pressure balance and also in the energy, uh, in the radiation energy. Um, and this result maybe uh, is slightly surprising and it's contradictory to uh, what was previously thought. And it is in accordance with a uh, uh, recent uh, research published uh, in our group uh, where indirect uh, measurements of the magnetic field along with uh, shockwave computations uh, show these exact um, uh, conclusions. And of course, MHD uh, modeling uh, in three dimensions is required to understand this, the very complicated physics which underline these processes. And to this end, we will also produce, um, we also intend to produce the magnetic field distribution along the Z direction, not only along the radius. So, thank you very much. This is because um, if you look the way we are, here. if you look at the, at the current, you see that the current reaches its peak before stagnation, then it drops a little bit. 
and the column of the plasma remains relatively uniform. Even though the inside is stagnating, the outermost radius is, is stays about 10, 10 millimeters. This is the reason. For it. The orbit in the. Um, I'll try to go. I suppose we shall this thing. Uh, <laughs> the orbit in the outermost uh, point here, um, this is a result from uh, the, the uncertainties we have in determining the, the radius of the column, because we, we rely on two dimensional imaging and then there's a question of contrast. And also due to the fact that this imaging is taken, uh, and the experiments are taken within a 10 nanoseconds exposure time. So the current changes within this uh, 10 nanoseconds. It's not constant. Yeah, this is the, the, um, the maximum uh, temporal resolution we have. In this, this uh, specific measurement, it was 10 nanoseconds. Um, we can go down to half a nanosecond. So, uh, because the current changes, there is some, um, uh, some deviation, and th these are the outer ones. The inner ones, um, I mean, here, uh, the uncertainties are determined, again, from the, um, uh, slightly from the uh, radius, but mostly from the uncertainty in determining the position of the shift. Because we rely on, on Zeeman shift from the um, unshifted line, from the unpolarized line. So we have some uncertainties in determining what is the exact wavelength, what is the resolution. Okay. Uh, 